So for me, I want B to be the new thing. And this is difficult to, to understand, but I'll explain it in a second. Which is the case of population growth. Population growth is the new thing that has emerged in our, in our essay. We, we started initially with, the, uh, with opponents, and we recognized that there was a connection between um, conservation, water conservation, and the amount of water that was used at surface level. Sort of a, a very generalized claim. We, we next used modus tollens, and we recognized what was a little bit more interesting, the relationship between groundwater, right, and I drew the picture for this, right, the relationship between the amount of, the quantity, and we underlined it, right, the quantity of groundwater that is available and consumption at surface level. Same idea, deeper concept. We're going a different level, a much deeper level now, same idea, much deeper concept, with respect to the amount of people, obviously consumption is contingent on the amount of people and available groundwater, right? So three layers of the same argument, just increasingly more refined, nuanced analysis of each part. The idea is why, why is population growth the new thing? Because I know that I can connect, by implication growth, population growth to things that have absolutely nothing to do with water conservation. Remember, and this is the hard part, so I, I hope I get this right. We recognize that there are multiple conditional claims in this argument. There's a conditional claim that connects water conservation um, specifically in terms of the available amount of water in the ground with um, its ability to sustain, this is sort of where we are now, with its ability to sustain population of X. And that makes sense, right? If your population becomes too big, then you will quickly consume all of the water that's available. So that's cool. But if we recognize that there is a, there might be, and there is a conditional claim between these two things, well then, are there aspects of population growth that have nothing to do with water? Of course there is. Urbanization, violence, um, um, educational accessibility. Generate increased generated uh, increased potential to generate tax revenue. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that you can uh, formulate conditional claims in terms of population growth. Okay, now, so if you're following me, I mean, this lecture is not you know it's it, you've got it you got to sort of focus on it, right? Since we recognize undeniably that there might be this relationship between population growth and water conservation in a conditional sense, and we recognize that there might be. Um, a connection, a conditional connection between population growth and anything else, then it's very likely the case that we can use population growth since it's, a it's an aspect of conditional claims for each and connect the two. Right? And, and connect the two. Right? So that the idea is there is a very, there is a very real possibility that I can connect um, these two aspects of the argument, and actually, like, I'm way over right now, so I'm going to, where am I at right now, um, alternatives, I'm going to read this last bit, then I'm going to pause it, because I'm like a minute and three over, and then we'll come back, so, why, because I know that I can connect, I just read this, I can connect by implication, population growth to things that have absolutely nothing to do with water conservation, which isn't at all true for my other alternatives, so I've, I've personally selected population growth, why, because it'll play perfectly into my hypothetical syllogism because there is a relationship between population growth and water conservation but there's also a relationship between population growth and stuff that has nothing at all to do with water conservation and then I can make the implication that you know water conservation can lead to something that you would never have thought was connected to water conservation right and that's the point that's the driving point okay so I'm gonna pause right there and then I will uh, come back and continue the analysis. It's, it's definitely going to take me more time than I thought because I have quite a way to go. Um, so I'm going to pause right now. Okay, um, so bottom of page 12 now. Um, thus, while you can select anything you like, for me, the better selection for B is population growth. I want it to be population growth. Uh, why? Because that necessitates selecting B for to be population growth necessitates a connection between water conservation and so many other things via this new link B as functionally effective in parts 
two and three of the hypothetical syllogism. Obviously, part two is B in terms of its role as consequence one, but also B in terms of its role as antecedent one, uh, antecedent two, right? So B assumes the role of consequence one and antecedent two, which is the direct connection for, you know, the reaffirmation of consequence, the reaffirmation of antecedent one and uh, consequence two, right? Get my brain around that. All right, so obviously we're at a different level now, so it's going to get a little bit more complicated and less sort of prep, more sort of analysis. Specifically, what we are doing is we've identified and posited in the application of modus tollens in our previous argument the potential conditional claim and relationship between population growth, water stability, and levels of water. Water pumping, population growth, and levels of water. We posit that conceptually and remove the specificity so that we have a generalized claim. We see that this generalized claim then lends itself to a hypothetical syllogism because the idea of population growth is connected to water conservation, but it's connected to so many other things. The fact that this idea, it doesn't really matter what the idea is, the fact that any idea has a connection which has been addressed in some literature, but you immediately know that it might also be connected to something else, means that that idea could and should facilitate the function of B. Right? It should facilitate the function of B. If, and now here's, a, here's, a, here's an important point, if when you're reading, now we have to talk abstract, right? If when you're reading whatever it is that you're reading from an author and you cite this, this idea and the author uses the idea in this function, then you need to recognize that you will have to create, when you make your hypothetical syllogism, this will be given because the author will present you with this, and you will need to create a relationship that results in this idea being the consequence rather than the antecedent and vice versa. If the author gives you the relationship and you like this idea and this idea comes as a consequence, then you need to formulate your argument in such a manner that it becomes the antecedent. But it could be the case that it's given to you by some other author <clears throat> as the antecedent and then you have the obligation of constructing your argument such that it becomes the consequence of something else. Right? So I, I, I never thought of that when I was writing this, the, the notes for the series, but <clears throat> You should recognize that, right? You should recognize that. And I'm trying to think if I can do a quick example off the top. Let's say you get, um, okay, let's say you're, you're doing a paper on, look at my, let me look at my wall, I got tons of things to, uh, you look, you're doing your paper on um, child soldiers. And someone says, someone gives you the antecedent that if um, children are neglected within these parts of the world, da, 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 then there's a greater likelihood that they will result in violence, right? So if children are neglected, then they will result, they, they might have a proclivity for violence. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good relationship. If children are neglected, they, there's, there's a proclivity in these children towards violence. We recognize that if we like the idea, the idea of children, children neglect, the, the neglect of children, we like that idea, then the fact that I like that idea, I have to identify in the literature what role, what part of the argument does that facilitate. Well, if children are neglected, oh, that's the antecedent, then they result in violence. Okay, I don't really care so much about the, the violence part, but if children are neglected, that's the antecedent. So it assumes this form. Okay, now I need that to be the consequence, right? Can I create an argument? This is off the top, seriously, I did not prep this, right? Um, can I create an argument, but I'm showing you real time that you can do this, right, as a demonstration. Can I posit that as a consequence? So if something happens, then um, there's a greater, a greater likelihood for childhood neglect. Yeah, okay, this off the top. If, if, um, if you, and I'm just putting this out there, right, <laughs> if you come from um, a single family, right? And I don't believe this because I came from a single family myself, but I'm just making this argument up off the top, right? If you come from, to, to, to show you, right?